my life to you, I give shout from the inside out. Welcome to From the Inside Out with Pastor Tim Moulter of Calvary Chapel, Fergus Falls in Minnesota. We're glad you could join us today. Sit tight, get your Bible, and get ready to get in the Word with us as we go verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and book by book through the Word of God. Well, with that, let's turn in our Bibles to Joshua chapter 20, looking at chapter 20 and 21. The title of our study is The Places of Refuge. So we continue our study through the Bible, going verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book. We are now here in Joshua chapter 20 and 21. Chapter 20 is going to talk about the cities of refuge. Uh, really, uh, we looked at this back as they were defined in Numbers 35. But now we're going to see that Joshua is obeying the command that God gave to Moses to establish these cities. And so we'll take a look at that. We'll see how God provides a place of safety and how it points us to Jesus. And then chapter 21, we'll deal with uh, the Levites, and we'll talk a little bit more about them and about how their inheritance is in the Lord, and we'll find our inheritance is in Jesus as well. Our security is in him. So with that, let's take a look at the first six verses here in uh, chapter 20 of the book of Joshua, and we'll see that there's a need for these cities of refuge. So Joshua chapter 20, picking up here in verse 1. The Lord also spoke to Joshua, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, Appoint for yourselves cities of refuge, of which I spoke to you through Moses, that the slayer who kills a person accidentally or unintentionally may flee there, and they shall be your refuge from the avenger of blood. And when he flees to one of those cities and stands at the entrance of the gate of the city and declares his case in the hearing of the elders of that city, they shall take him into the city as one of them, and give him a place that he may dwell among them. Then if the avenger of blood pursues him, they shall not deliver the slayer into his hand, because he struck his neighbor unintentionally, but did not hate him before him. And he shall dwell in that city until he stands before the congregation of judgment, and until the death of the one who is high priest in those days." Then the slayer may return and come to his own city and his own house, to the city from which he fled. We'll pause there. Now you have to remember that the system for justice and the whole judicial system that Israel had at that time is a little bit different than the system we have today in America. Uh, we have to remember this time there were no jails, there were no prisons, there was no overcrowding in the prisons or early release because the prisons are too crowded. There was none of that going on. There was no police. There was no Texas Rangers or I'm the sheriff in these parts of the town kind of stuff. There was, it wasn't any of that. And so if there was a nonviolent crime done, like let's say you broke into someone's house and you stole their TV, you got caught, you had to do something called restitution. You had to go and you had to buy that person. Well, you had to give back their TV, but then also you had to pay back extra. You had to buy them another TV. And so if you took something of theirs, you had to pay back sometimes three up, sometimes even up to fourfold. So now they've got four TVs. And you kind of learn that lesson like, I'm not gonna do this again. It didn't pay. <laughs> and crime doesn't pay, right? At least it's not supposed to. And so this was the mindset, right, that if you did something wrong, you had to make things right. But say there was an accidental death that occurred. It wasn't on purpose. You know, you're, you're outside, you're minding your own business, you're chopping firewood, you're swinging your axe, and, and all of a sudden the head of the axe just flies off in your neighbor's yard. And you hear a, oh, thud. And you're like, I think that was my neighbor. Uh, whoops. And you go over and you check it out and you realize he's not breathing. Uh, these don't look good. What do you do? It was an accident. And so they, there was no hatred. There was no malice towards the person. It was purely an accident. Well, you were to 
flee to a city of refuge, and then you were required to live in that city of refuge. Now see, on the other hand, you really hated that guy, and you were thinking of ways that you could get at him, right? You had an ax to grind with him, to say, and you, you wanted him, right? You, you didn't want to bury the hatchet, you wanted to go after that guy, right? And you were thinking about ways that you could take him out. And so on purposely, right, you murder the person, um, and there were two or three witnesses, people saw it, well, then you were guilty of that crime and you were going to face the death penalty. And that was done publicly. It was to put fear into people. Then as they saw this, they would realize, man, this is, this is not the way to live life. You do something horrible, there's consequences for it. And so it put a fear in the public that, hey, I don't want to hurt anyone, right? Because it doesn't pay, it, it, and I'm only going to harm myself and my family. And so it caused people not to fly off the handle and not harm others. Um, but if that accident did happen, and the deceased person's family was upset about it, and they were going to go after that person, um, they were known as the avenger of blood. You messed with my family, you, you hurt someone in my family, I'm coming after your family. And so this mindset of vengeance or of vengeance was, was common that you, you messed with me, I'm going to come and, and mess with you. It's kind of like how maybe the mafia would operate or maybe some gains would operate, right? You take out somebody of us, we're coming for you, and we're not only going to make it even, we're going to get, and then some, right? We're going to make sure that you never mess with us again. So this was kind of ingrained in that culture. And so they had these cities of refuge established to protect the innocent person of being murdered and killed themselves. So when someone was fleeing from the avenger of blood, they came to a city, they talked to the elders uh, there in the city gates where a lot of the uh, business interactions and dealings of communities happened there in the city gates, told them what happened, they would hear it, uh, and then they would protect that person who had fled to their city. And so when the avenger of blood came, there was no legal standing for the city to give that person up and deliver them into their hands um, because it was unintentional, right? There was no hatred beforehand. It was purely an accident. And so God knows that accidents are going to happen, right? That there's things that we do unintentionally. And so he needed uh, a place for people to be protected. Again, Israel had its legal system with judgments often based on intent and premeditation, and to be protected against the avenger of blood, that person had to stay within the walls of the city of refuge. Had they gone out of the city of refuge, the avenger of blood could come and take vengeance upon them. They had to stay there within the walls for safety. Or the other option was when the standing high priest passed away then they could go back home to their city, to, to their house, and they would be able to be there, protected against the wrath from the avenger of blood. We talked a little bit about the high priest and the importance of that, and we'll come to that again in just a few moments. But let's take a look at the actual cities that were established. There's going to be six of them, uh, and we'll take a look at that here in verse 7, and we'll go through verse 9. So they appointed Kadesh, in Galilee, and the mountains of Naphtali, Shechem, and the mountains of Ephraim, and Kerjath Erba, which uh, is Hebron, and the mountains of Judah. And on the other side of the Jordan, by Jericho eastward, they assign Bezir in the wilderness of the plain, from the tribe of Reuben, Ramoth, and Gilead, from the tribe of Gad, and Golan, and Bashan, from the tribe of Manasseh. Verse 9. These were the cities appointed for all the children of Israel and for the stranger who dwelt among them, that whoever killed a person accidentally might flee there and not die by the hand of the avenger of blood until he stood before the congregation. Now again, these were cities of protection that God had established. And on a map, we can kind of see these cities were scattered throughout the region of Israel. And so the thought was no matter where you were in Israel, if this happened, you weren't very far from a city of refuge. Was the, 
within a, about a day's worth of a, of a run to one of those cities. You could make it. You could get there, and you would be safe. And so these work, we see, these also weren't only for the benefit of the Israelite, a person of Jewish heritage and descent, but it says also for the stranger. So maybe he had a traveler passing through the land, and if it was an accident that happened, he could also flee to one of these cities. And so God's also looking out for those outside of Israel. And at that time, if you weren't Jewish, you were known as a Gentile, a non-Jew. And so God also has a concern for people who were Gentiles, which is interesting because when you get to the New Testament, the religious leaders had a whole different mindset that God didn't care about Gentiles. He only cared about Jewish people. And when you see Jesus come and he interacts with Gentiles, or he talks about Gentiles as heroes like Samaritans, you find out the religious leaders aren't very happy about that. Again, God's heart is for the Jewish people, but his heart is for the whole world, right? For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son, so that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. So we see God's concern also for the stranger. And... Uh, we see that his justice is to be applied to all without partiality. God values life. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, verse 24, Jesus said, Look at the birds. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn. Yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable are you than birds? Does God care about the birds? Yes. Does God care about humans? Yes. A lot more than he cares about birds. And we should have that same mindset to realize the sanctity and the value of human life. All right. We never want to see life taken irrationally. We also don't want to see uh, life taken without thought process, that there's a human life involved in that process. And so we see that the scriptures teach us about the value and the sanctity of life, that all human life is sacred, created in the image of God. So we want to have that same mindset to value human life. And we also see that God is just and fair, right? He wants to deal with those that are committing crimes, but he's also merciful, right? And he's forgiving, and if there's something that happens and it's an accident, he is kind, right? He allows there to be a place of refuge. But he also knows the human heart, and Jeremiah declares this in his writings, that the human heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? And despite what common Disney movies say, follow your heart, that your heart is good, the Bible teaches something completely different. The Bible says the human heart is evil, it's wicked, it's set on selfishness, and it's prideful, right? It, and the reality is, apart from Christ, we think a lot about self, right? The self-preservation. In Christ, we're hopefully thinking about him and we're thinking about others, right? But when it comes to sin, the human issue with sin is that if we don't agree with God, if we don't get his forgiveness, well, mankind then excuses sin, justifies sin, and the world today says, well, it wasn't a crime. I mean, like in California. And yes, they came on the store, they stole merchandise, but it was less than a thousand. We're not going to get the police involved. It's okay. I'm sure the business owners don't feel that way, right? Or, yeah, they did something wrong in, you know, 20 years ago, they would have put in handcuffs, put in jail, but today, let's just say they didn't hurt anyone. They were doing things they weren't supposed to do or they were looking at things they weren't supposed to look at online, but they didn't hurt anyone. And so this mindset is creeping into the culture where anything goes, right? And so they're passing laws where morality of right and wrong goes out the window. There's, there's no absolutes anymore, and that's, that's a crazy world to live in. We also see, sadly today, that some people actually prefer living a life in prison than free as a citizen. And, and that's a sad place, a sad reality that some people would see, I get food, I get clothing, I get shelter, all provided free, 
every day for me behind bars. I'd rather do that than try and go and live a life for myself. And you just see the way that the enemy has ingrained in certain people that why bother trying to live life? I'm not valuable. I'm, I'm a burden to society. And that's not God's intent at all, right? God's intent is that we would have a relationship with him. We would find our value and our worth from him. But then we'd also be in a relationship with others and realize that we're part of the community, that we're needed in the community, right? That, that people would miss us if we weren't there. So we realize that, that we need to have that mindset that God has, right? That when we do blow it, we need to ask for forgiveness, get right with him, get right with those we've offended. But we also need to realize that um, God is forgiving. He's merciful. 1 John 1, 9 says that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we need to have that same mindset. And we need to know that God is offended by sins that are committed. And sin to God is just as wrong committed with our hands, if committed, in our hearts. You recall Jesus expounded upon this in the Sermon on the Mount, in the Gospel of Matthew, and he talked about how looking at someone lustfully was the same as committing adultery in the heart. Having hatred in your heart towards someone, that was the same as murder of the heart. I mean, he's looking deep within, and God will judge the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Better to come clean with the Lord and say, Lord, I need you. I need your forgiveness. I need you to change my heart, make it new. Give me a heart like yours. And God can do that, right? And God provided that way through Jesus Christ. Jesus lived a perfect, sinless life, right? I mean, I can't imagine being one of his brothers and always hearing, why can't you be more like Jesus? But he was perfect. He was sinless. And then he willingly went to the cross and died for you and for me. We owed a debt of sin we could never pay. But Jesus paid a debt of sin he never owed because he did that for us because he loves us. He wants to forgive us. He wants a relationship with us. And then he gives us his Holy Spirit that we can become born again, born from above, where God then empowers us to follow after him and, and, and have a changed perspective, a changed thought, a changed heart, a changed life. We're no longer living for self. We're now living f for God. And we're wanting to help those around us because our motive is we love because he first loved us. We're not trying to get anything from anyone. We just want to be helpful. We want to point them to Jesus. And so we see that this is the work that God can do. And the reality is when we do sin, we go to the place of refuge. We go to the Lord. And I hope you can kind of see that I'm trying to bridge that gap here, that the cities of refuge are a picture for us in Jesus Christ. Psalm 41, uh, excuse me, Psalm 46, verse 1, says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And then uh, the latter part of Hebrews 6, 18 says, Therefore, we who have fled to God for refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. So God is our refuge. We can turn to him in those times of panic, those times of trouble. We can find our help in him. We can find safety in the Lord. We can find also peace in the Lord. Pastor David Guzik uh, said, both Jesus and the cities of refuge are within easy reach of the needy person and anyone could get to the place of refuge. Both Jesus and the cities of refuge are open to all. No one needs to fear that they would be turned away from their place of refuge in their time of need. Both Jesus and the cities of refuge are the only alternative for the one in need. Without the specific protection, they would be destroyed. Both Jesus and the cities of refuge provide protection only within their boundaries. To go outside means death. And with both Jesus and the cities of refuge, full freedom comes with the death 
of the high priest. And Jesus, being our great high priest, died for us. Right? Not only was he the high priest making intercession for us through his sacrifice, but he also became the lamb, the perfect, spotless, unblemished lamb, the sacrifice for our sins. In the Old Testament, the high priest would come and he would offer the sacrifice again and again and again. And every year on the Day of Atonement, there was the sacrifice given for the whole nation. Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. But Jesus died once and for all. His sacrifice is sufficient. And he proved it by rising from the dead three days later. The Father received the sacrifice the Son uh, gave, right? It was sufficient for our sins. So we see there's a correlation between the cities of refuge and Jesus. However, there's one critical distinction between the two, between the cities of refuge and our Jesus of refuge. And that is the cities of refuge only helped the innocent, right? Those that this was unintentional, didn't mean to hurt my neighbor, it just happened. But in Jesus, if because we're guilty, we can come before him and find forgiveness, even those things that we did on purpose. So there's sins of omission. I did know that was wrong at the time. I did it. There's sins of commission. I committed it. I knew it was wrong. Both we can find forgiveness in Christ Jesus. I know that troubles some people to think that there are people behind bars that did something wrong and yet they can receive Christ and we'll see him in heaven. God's merciful, right? The Bible teaches us that God's not willing any perish, but all come to repentance. And so that should be our desire as well, to see people get saved, to know the Lord, to find refuge in him. And so we have a great high priest in Jesus Christ. We have a place of refuge in our Lord Jesus Christ. So we need to know that God is our refuge. He's our strength. He's our help, our very present help in our time of need. And based upon that, we shouldn't fear anything else. We should have a deeper trust and reliance in the Lord that he is good. He's just, he's fair, he's merciful, and he's kind. So we see that these cities of refuge were set up for the protection of the people, and God is concerned about all people. Well, we move into chapter 21, and we'll see there's cities that are established for the Levites. These are a specific group um, of priests and, uh, that did the duties within the sanctuary and later on in the temple of God on behalf of the people. So we'll pick up here in verse 1, and we'll look at the first three verses here in chapter 21. Then the heads of the father's houses of the Levites came near to Eleazar the priest, to Joshua the son of Nun, and to the heads of the father's houses of the tribes of the children of Israel. And they spoke to them at Shiloh in the land of Canaan, saying, The Lord commanded through Moses to give us cities to dwell in, with their common lands for our livestock. So the children of Israel gave to the Levites from their inheritance, at the commandment of the Lord, these cities and their common lands. We'll pause there. Now again, we need to remember the Levites were among the the children of Israel. And if you want to get technical, there were 13 tribes of Israel. We only commonly called the 12 tribes of Israel, and that's because the Levites received no land. They were not given a portion of land with its boundaries within Israel. Um, And so The other tribes did, but the reality is they didn't. But still, they had to live somewhere. So each tribe gave certain cities and common lands which surrounded those cities to the tribe of Levi. And this, again, was because God had declared to Levites that he would be their inheritance. God had called them to this work of ministry. They were to keep their eyes on him and be dependent upon him. And so these cities were appointed to the Levites, and there's a list of them in verse 4 through verse 40, and they're according to three main family divisions, the Kothites, 
and they're going to receive 23 cities from six tribes. Uh, the Gershites, they'll receive 13 cities from four tribes. And then the Merorites, and they get 12 cities from three tribes. Now, we've looked at this when we looked at, at the tabernacle being established, but there's interesting um, work that God had for each of these uh, distinct clans within the tribe of Levi. The Kohathites had charge of caring for the sacred objects that were used for the sacrifice and used for the offerings within the sanctuary. So this group, they were burden bearers, right? They were caring for the holy elements within uh, the tabernacle. That'd be like those within the church service today who have a care for um, the holy elements of like communion, right? And there are those of you that help. Uh, we have communion usually the first Sunday of the month. You come here early, you help with setting up the communion stuff. When we have our time of communion, you help distribute the communion. Afterwards, you're cl helping with cleanup of the cups and making sure the juice and the crackers get put away. You're helping in all of that process, right? Or with the worship songs. There's those of you that seen and those that are um, learning how to play and desiring to play and, and lead worship. There's those in the, the media sound booth that are helping with the songs and, and helping to make sure all that runs smooth. Uh, and so that's another part of it that, that we can see that would ap apply to us. Those that are dealing with sermons, so like pastors, um, those that are in prayer and intercession for the people. So we would say this group was, is very similar to maybe like elders in the church, right? They were there and taking care of the, um, the most holy tasks. They were there and helping make sure that the service would continue to run smoothly. Then there were the Gershonites, and they took care of the decorations of the sanctuary. Uh, they took care of all the tassels and the banners and the ropes and, the, and all the utensils, making sure everything looked great. Uh, this would be like modern-day servants within the church that did the decorations both inside and outside the church. You could probably tell I didn't decorate the church building, nor would you want me to decorate the church building. I think I picked out the artwork over there next to the offering box. Everything else, I did not do it. I do not have that, the core sense. Um, so I thank you to those uh, that helped with that and um, keep this place looking nice and in order those that help with refreshments, right? Helping to, us to have an enjoyable time together, making the place look good. This would also apply to those that helped with organization, right? And some of you are more skilled in that area than others, um, where you know where things belong and you know ahead of time, hey, we're getting low on this, we probably need to order something. This is that group within the tabernacle. They had those kind of mindsets and skills and, and they were able to help uh, keep track of it all. Then there were the, the Murrites, and they were retaining the daily use of the mobile sanctuary. These were the ones who were, we'd say, like are the modern day servants, right? They're the ones that are, are making sure that um, everything's in its proper place. They're helping with whatever needs to be done. And they're cleaning up after all the sacrifices that would take place in the tabernacle and later on in the temple. Um, they were, you would say, the cleaning crew, right? And so for us, in, in our church setting, uh, this would be those that help with keeping the maintenance of the church building, vacuuming and mopping and cleaning and ensuring that everything we need is on hand, right? And taking care of all those things, taking the trash out, the recycle out, all those things that most people would, would not think about, right? But there's many hands that make light work. There's many hands behind the scenes that are taking care of all those things. And so we see that there's a part for each of these clans that had responsibility in the sanctuary of God. At the same time, these groups remind us that not everyone has the same calling. Yet God has given us each responsibilities for our families, for our local church, and also for our personal holiness. God has a plan and a purpose in all of that. And we each have a way that we can serve the Lord by serving others. Now, I'm not going to get into each of these names listed in verse 40 through verse 40. If you want to read those, be my guest. I will probably mispronounce them anyways. But I will tell you that for the Levites, God was their focus for their service unto the Lord. It reminds me of a song, I want to say it was by Stephen Curtis Chapman. 
years ago. It was called For the Sake of the Call. And if you've never heard that song, write it down, Google it, check it out later. But he talks about how the disciples of Jesus left everything for the sake of the call. And they knew that there wasn't going to be applause. There wasn't going to be a lot of uh, stardom coming with this. They, they left everything behind to follow Jesus. And they knew it was going to be difficult from the very start. But it was for the sake of the call. They knew that God had called them by name. And that was enough. It reminds me that we need to know the same. You see, the Levites knew their source of their strength was the Lord. And it was in the significance of their calling. God has called us by name as well. He's got good works prepared in advance that we should walk in. What are those good works? I don't know. You need to ask him and say, God, here I am. Send me. How can I help? How can I serve today? And he'll show you. He'll, he'll lead you and guide you into those things he prepared already for you to do. So we want to have that mindset that our focus is on the Lord. We can serve others and work as unto the Lord. And if you're in the workplace, you need to realize that. Yes, you're doing work that's ultimately going to help and impact your customers. Yes, you're in work that's going to help your coworkers and ultimately for your boss or your manager or director. But at the end of it all, ultimately you're doing work as unto the Lord. Right? He's the commander in chief. He's the one we're going to have to give an account of someday. And we want to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. And so we want to have that mindset that we're doing everything for the Lord. He is our inheritance. And at the same time, our hearts should long to be in heaven with our great high priest to realize all the things we're doing down here for him, one day we'll be with him in glory forever and ever. And even then, there'll be stuff that'll have us do, right? And you see that even before the fall of man in the Garden of Eden. God had a task for man in the garden, right? Work was probably a lot more enjoyable before the fall, let's say that. And it's gonna be the same someday with the Lord, right? When we're in glory. It's gonna be enjoyable. It's gonna be an act of service, an act of worship. And that's the mindset I think the Lord wanted here for these priests. So, that kind of summarizes verse 40 through verse, uh, verse four through verse 40. Um, I'll pick up here in verse 41, and um, we'll go through verse 44. It says, all the cities of the Levites within the possession of the children of Israel were 48 cities with their common lands. Every one of these cities had its common lands surrounding it. Thus were all these cities. So the Lord gave to Israel all the land of which he had sworn to give their fathers. And they took possession of it and dwell in it. Right, let's do one more. Verse 44, the Lord gave them rest all around according to all that he had sworn to their fathers, and not a man of all their enemies stood against them. The Lord delivered all their enemies into their hand. We'll pause there. So after this long list of names, we see God is fulfilling his promise of giving them the land, giving them rest from their enemies. And again, we see that God wanted Levites kind of sprinkled throughout uh, the land of Israel and that they would also be able to serve among the people. He never intended to be a, a state or a, a, a country of Levites, right? He wanted them scattered throughout to have this priestly influence among the people, a presence among all the tribes of Israel. As I was thinking about that, I think there's an application for us that God wants us to be sprinkled throughout the world throughout our city, throughout our workplaces, throughout our community, and throughout society. We don't want to head off and just make a Christian community, right? To have this holy huddle, to be known as the, the chosen frozen or something like that, right? We want to go and, and have influence in the community. We don't want to be like the monks that go and, you know, live among themselves. We want to go and be scattered. We want to go and and point people to our Lord to be salt and be light, as Jesus says in the Gospel of Matthew. So 
we're not to be in this huddle. We're, we're to go out into the world. Right? We're called to be ambassadors of Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth. An ambassador is somebody who represents the kingdom, right? Represents the king. And we're to have that same mindset, right? If we were to go over to Australia and people say, well, what's it like in America? We could share them. Well, what's it like in America and how the government operates or doesn't operate correctly, right? Well, we could relay that information. But if somebody asks, about spiritual stuff and said, well, what about your King Jesus? What can he tell me about him? What is his kingdom like? Hopefully we'd be able to answer that question and tell others about his kingdom and his righteousness and how loving and merciful he is and tell them about the good news of what he's done for us. So we want to be ambassadors unto the end of the earth and we have many resources to want to encourage you in that uh, to encourage and equip you to share your faith with your friends and your family and coworkers and strangers. Uh, we've got many growth resources on our church website. I want to say like 10 or 12 resources listed of uh, apologetics and witnessing tools and things to help. We also have some out over there next to our, our resource area there in the entry. We've got gospel tracks, help you engage with people, how to have those conversations with people. Um, and so we can be able to have a presence on those around us. That they would see that we're representing a king and a kingdom as ambassadors. Well, in closing, we'll take a look at verse 45. It says, Not a word failed of any good thing which the Lord had spoken to the house of Israel. All came to pass. This verse gives us the testimony of God's faithfulness. Not one good word of God failed. God kept his word. God kept his promises. Right? There are those people that make promises and then are unable to fulfill those promises. And I get it. Life happens. Things get in the way. Right? But when God makes a promise, he keeps his promise. God honors his word. And so God will not fail to keep his promises. All those good things that God promised, he fulfilled. And if there was any failure to fully possess the land, it wasn't because of God. God made adequate provision. It'd be because man failed to fully follow the Lord. And that's the same true with us. God has been completely faithful to you. He's made provision for your salvation through Jesus Christ. He made a way for you to be clean. He made a way for you to be right with him through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, through his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And he made a way for you to be continually walking in the spirit, walking in victory. He's given us the Holy Spirit as a gift. He says a a down payment, a, a guarantee of what's to come, if you will, to lead us, to empower us, to guide us. Proverbs 30, verse 5 says, Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to all who come to him for protection. So my hope is through this study we would find our refuge is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Our security, our hope, our peace it's found in him. It's knowing who he, is, who he is, but also trusting in him personally. And I would hope we also find our inheritances in the Lord. That the joy that God wants us to experience is in that relationship with him and knowing that our, our real home is in heaven. We're just ambassadors. We're passing through. We're representing our king and his kingdom. And so my hope is we would trust and all the promises of God. We'd read our Bibles, we would know that there's many promises that God has in his word for us. To know he is faithful to keep his word, and that he loves each one of us personally. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word this morning. We thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. Faithful and true faithful to love us, 
faithful to forgive us, faithful to sustain us, and keep us close to you. We ask, God, that you would help us as your ambassadors in this world to rightly represent you. We want to ask, Lord, that we would speak of you and point people to you. Lord, we know that as the world gets darker and darker, this little light of ours is going to shine brighter and brighter. Help us, Lord, not to hide it. Help us to learn how we can share this good news, to share our faith with those around us, to tell them, Lord, that they can find refuge in you. They can find safety, security, peace, hope and forgiveness in a relationship with you. Lord, we pray if there be anyone here this morning among us or maybe watching the live stream online who need to surrender their life to you, God, we ask that today would be that day of salvation. If you're here this morning as every Christian is praying and you say, Pastor Tim, pray for me, pray with me. I need to get right with God. I need his forgiveness. I need to have that assurance that if I died today, I'd be in heaven. If that's you this morning and you're ready to make the decision to put your trust in Jesus Christ, you believe he died on the cross for your sins, was buried and rose from the dead, I simply want to lead you in a prayer where you make that decision to put your trust in him. And if you're ready to do that, I simply want to encourage you to repeat this prayer after me and truly they mean it from your heart. God, I realize that you love me. And I see that I am a sinner and that my sin has separated me from you. I understand, Jesus, that you came to this earth You lived a perfect life and you willingly went to the cross to die for my sins. You were buried and rose from the grave. God, I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. Come into my heart and my life today. I surrender all of my life to you. I ask that you'd put your spirit within me, that I may do your will and follow you. God, I thank you for knowing me. I thank you for forgiving me. And I thank you for loving me. I thank you for being my savior. I thank you for being my Lord. And I thank you for being my friend. I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Look, if that was you and that was the first time you prayed to receive Christ as your Savior and Lord or maybe a rededication, let me know, I'd love to encourage you, give you some resources, pray with you, give you a Bible if you don't have one. You've been listening to From the Inside Out with Pastor Tim Moulter of Calvary Chapel, Fergus Falls in Minnesota. We're glad you could join us today as we study God's Word cover to cover verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and book by book. Would you like to partner with us? Consider becoming a giver with us to support this ministry. Please visit ccfergusfalls.com slash giving. Find out more about this ministry and all of our ministries. Check out ccfergusfalls.com. May God bless you as you study his word with us and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Life to you I give shout from the inside